Jesus Christ was a handsome man. He had nothing to hide, he said. Give bread to the hungry. Bring the homeless inside. Jesus Christ was a dangerous man. That's the way that he died. Good to the people you love. Love everybody you love. The people, be good to the people, be good to the people you love, love everybody you love. Dr. King was a preacher, he had God on his side. He said, All God's children are brothers. Don't look at your mother and son. The king was a dangerous man. So may that we die. The people you love, love everybody you love. Awesome, right? Thank you, singers. Good morning. Welcome to this gathering of Madison Unitarian Universalists. It is so very good to be together. My name is Karen Armina. I use she, her pronouns, and I am honored and proud to serve as the minister for the James Reeb UU congregation. <laughs> yeah. Right on. My name is Kelly Aspruth Jackson. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I serve as co-senior minister of the First Unitarian Society of Madison, which is pretty awesome, too. Uh, oh, yes, that's right. If you are here today with joy in your heart, we bid you welcome. If you are here with us with tears in your eyes and pain in your heart, we bid you welcome. If you are here and a little unsure of this people, this gathering, this community, we bid you welcome. If you are here with an overwhelming love for your faith and your companions on the journey, we bid you welcome. 
However you found your way here, whatever you are carrying with you, we bid you welcome, and we are so very glad that you are here with us. We would like to bring your attention to a couple of things. First, there are orders of service on that greeter table that I think many of you bypassed. If you're somebody who wants an order of service in your hands, maybe greeter, yeah, look at Joan, she's already on it. Joan will bring you one, just let her know. We also want to bring your attention to the busy hands corner. This is a James Reeb tradition where our uh, director of family ministry hangs out with activities and invites anybody who wants to, children, families, people of all ages and abilities to come join and keep your hands busy. There are all kinds of activities over there. That table is back in this corner. Can you all raise your hands a little bit? There's a bunch of folks already over there, but there's plenty of room. Um, we also want to encourage you to read the weekly announcement email that you received from your home congregation this week. We are not doing any live announcements this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rev. Ralph, pronouns he, him. And I serve as the minister of the third UU congregation here in Madison, Prairie UU Society. I would now like to invite us all to embrace a moment of silence and centering. I will ring the chime to start the time of silence and then ring the chime again at its ending. Thank you, Ralph. We gather this morning in witness and in celebration as Unitarian Universalists from three congregations and beyond. We gather as one body, knowing that the faith tradition to which we belong or which we're exploring or which we might be participating in for the very first time is larger than each of us and larger than the communities in which we worship regularly. We gather each with our own journeys and our own stories, our own sorrows and our own joys, our own needs and our own gifts. We gather as people who hold common values, justice, equity, transformation, pluralism, interdependence, and generosity, and hold love at the center. We light our chalice today, honoring our common connection and also the uniqueness that lives within each of our congregations and each of us. Mm. Ha, 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 ha,
Oh, smart. Okay. The so you saw the flame. Movie. It counts. <laughs> the eternal flame. All right. I invite you to sing the sung response printed in your order of worship. And let's keep singing. Our opening song is number 298, Wake Now My Senses. Mindful of a wide range of abilities as humans, I invite you to rise in body and or spirit and join in singing. Thank you, friends. Please be seated. There are also song sheets over there. So if, if that's something you need, give a wave as well, and our greeters will see you. Hey again, friends. This time in our service is the time for our message for all ages. I often, in, when I'm doing this uh, in a more familiar space, I often invite people to move around as they're comfortable. You can move around throughout the service as you are comfortable. I'm not going to call for the sitting on the floor. It's just not, uh, you know, we live, we learn, right, folks? So please be in a comfortable place and enjoy this message to you. You already heard who I am, but let me turn to my partner in telling this story and allow them to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Genevieve and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Director of Family Ministry at James Reeve. And we have a story for you today that comes from India, and there are two main characters in this story. You might be able to guess what sorts of animals they are, even before I tell you. So, perhaps you have seen 
images of elephant families walking in a line, holding trunk to tail to trunk to tail, all put together like they belong together. Now, this is how elephants would naturally be, but not all elephants get to naturally be. It happened once that there was a king who had just one elephant. That elephant lived alone in a magnificent stable with walls that were inlaid marble, beautiful, complex tile patterns on the floor, and bedding of the very finest hay. If the elephant ever showed the least sign of an itch, his caregiver, the mahout, took him down to a special private bath by the river so that he can roll in the mud and scrub in the water. When the elephant was hungry, he was served fine sweet rice with the freshest cabbages, bananas, oranges, and sea leaves that were followed always by an elephant-sized sugar cube. Really, the elephant had an easy life with nothing to complain about except being bored and lonely. And because his days were so empty and lacking in companionship, the elephant spent most of each day rocking back and forth and forth and back alone in his stable. Meanwhile, a skinny, scrawny dog lived just outside the royal stable. She lurked alone in the shadows and rarely had enough to eat. But she did have one pleasure in life each day. When she saw the mahout arrive with the elephant's barrels full of food, she would sit just below the stable window to enjoy those sweet fragrances of rice, cabbages, bananas, and sugar. Sometimes it almost made her feel full. One day, the stable door was left just a little bit open, enough for the skinny, scrawny dog to squeeze through. She skulked in the shadows, shivering and shaking, afraid of what might happen if the elephant saw her and did not wish to be disturbed. But hunger is one of the many things that can give us the courage to overcome fear. Mm. Now, do you think that the elephant noticed that skinny, scrawny dog staying low to the ground, close to the shadows, and doing her best to keep out of sight. What do you think? You think yes? And he knows? Well, well, he didn't, at least not at first. But the dog sure noticed the elephant she watched him eat all that delicious food, and she saw all the crumbs that dropped to the ground as he did so. And after some time spent watching, she worked up the courage to sneak between the elephant's tall legs and have her own little feast, licking up those crumbs. The elephant didn't say anything. He didn't look down at the dog, but he did start to rock back and forth less. The dog did not notice this change. She is focused on eating, understandably. And after the elephant had finished its meal and she had eaten all of his crumbs, she snuck back into the shadows to find a comfortable place to fall asleep. Now things went on like this for a while. Each day when the elephant was eating, the dog would sneak out from her hiding place and eat the crumbs and then go back again. The two did not speak or acknowledge each other, and the dog kept doing her best to be as quiet and hard to notice as possible. So do you think that the elephant knew she was there now? Hmm. Well, I can't say for sure, but I can say that each day the elephant seemed to spill more and more of his food so that the dog had more and more to eat. So the dog grew healthier and more comfortable. And then one day at mealtime, the elephant looked straight down at the dog. That made her suddenly afraid again. Was the elephant angry now that she definitely knew she was there? Was she, do you think the elephant was angry? No. <laughs> he was very happy that he wasn't alone. 
He reached out with his trunk and gave the dog a gentle pat on the head. The two of them then ate from the same barrel of food together as equals. When they were done, they took turns telling each other stories. That night when the elephant lay down to sleep on its special bed of very fine straw, he patted it with his trunk to show there was plenty of space for the dog too. This is how life went on for a while. The dog and the elephant living together as friends. The mahout, the elephant's caretaker, remember, eventually noticed that there was a dog living in the stables too, but the elephant didn't seem to mind, so he didn't die. But one day the mahout was in the market buying some of that very best rice and bananas and oranges and acacia leaves for the elephant to eat. When he heard that there was a merchant in town who was hoping to buy a dog. And he thought of that stray dog who had been living in the royal stables. And he thought that this might be a way to help the merchant to give the dog a permanent home and to earn a little bit of extra money for himself and his family. What would it matter if he sold the merchant the dog? What would it matter, friends? Hmm. The Mahout put the dog on a leash and brought her to the merchant. The merchant was very impressed by the dog, who looked healthy like she had been living a very happy life, because she had been. He paid the Mahout a good bit of money for the dog and set off for the next city on his journey. The Mahout continued to take care of the elephant. Things did not go well. The elephant had seemed so happy for months, but now he was the saddest the Mahout had ever seen him. He didn't want to eat or go down to the river for a bath. He just lay on the fancy tile floor of the stable all day. Now this worried the king. It was a big deal that he had his very own elephant, but much less impressive if that elephant barely ever moved. So he sent for his royal advisor and had them check into the problem. They checked the elephant's mouth, and the ears, they took his temperature, they counted the hairs on his tail, but then the advisor looked into his eyes and went right back to the king to report. The elephant was grieving. What could he have to grieve about? He had a wonderful life, plenty to eat, the fanciest place to live that any elephant had ever lived before. All the baths he could possibly want? The king asked the Mahout to explain, and the Mahout thought about this. What do you think he came up with as the reason for why the elephant was so sad? Oh, yeah! He missed his friend, the dog. The king sent word throughout the kingdom, calling the merchant to come to the palace at once and bring the dog along with. The merchant heard the order, and obey. He was glad to have an explanation for what was wrong because that beautiful, healthy, happy dog that he had purchased had become sad and sickly as soon as they left the city. The dog and the elephant were reunited. And do you think that they were happy to see each other? Both of them seemed to be happier and healthier from that day forward, because having a friend is some of the best medicine that there is. You all look very comfortable. Let's just remain seated while we sing Gathered Here in the Mystery of the Hour. We'll sing it through once all together. I think it's familiar to most of us. And then if you could divide yourselves down the middle, we'll have, we'll sing this as a round and you can go first on my left and go second on my right. Let's sing a round through twice. You guys will finish first. So when you get to the end, just sing spirit draw near one more time.
that's why it's there. Okay. That's why it's there. <laughs> We're missing someone. Ralph, come Ralph. on up and join us. <laughs> <clears throat> Before we begin our reflections, I think we have one more introduction to make. Thank you. We do. Hi. I feel like I'm the new guy. <laughs> I'm Kelly Krager. I am the other co-senior minister at the First Unitarian Society of Madison. And for those of you who may not know, today's my first uh, service back after a six-month sabbatical. So it is... <laughs> so it is very good to see you all this morning. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so last summer, we had the first annual collaborative service with all three of our congregations. And we focused last year on sharing a bit of some of our stories, right? The group of us who planned this service, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention Renee. Yeah. Um, what's Renee's last name? Deschard. Deschard, thank you. Renee Deschard from Prairie Lee had a, had a very big hand in helping to plan this service. So the group of us, including Renee, thought it would be maybe a natural step this year to reflect together a little bit on our congregation's visions and missions, right? And kind of as a way to explore what we might have in common and where we might differ mm -hmm. as we work on becoming a community of communities. So to that end, we developed three questions that give us a chance to share. And we are going to ask those questions of each other and muse a little bit together. So our first question is simply, what is your congregation's mission and vision statement? For Reeb, I'll answer first since I'm here. We don't actually have a vision statement and our board and I have realized that this is something we might wanna work on this year. Our mission statement, though, was rewritten in 2019 after we'd been using the statement that was created by our founding members in 1993. So here is that current statement that we're using from 2019. We are a faith community rooted in Unitarian Universalist principles, called by love to welcome the seeker, cultivate relationship, nurture spiritual wholeness, and grow justice in the world. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Prairie's mission vision statements were just adopted this past spring by a vote of the congregation. And here are the words for our mission. Guided by hope and kindness, we nurture a welcoming community that fosters caring connections, open-mindedness, lifelong learning, and spiritual growth while championing social justice and environmental stewardship. And our vision, we aspire to be a community where all voices are heard and valued collectively acting as a catalyst for positive change, inspiring empathy and curiosity to champion a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. First Unitarian Society's mission and vision statements have an ancient and storied history, having been created and approved by the membership Fully a year ago, our vision statement is, the vision of First Unitarian Society is to be a spiritual community of belonging. We will transform ourselves and society through the practices of radical welcome, deep listening, and compassionate, authentic connection. We envision a world fueled by love and justice. And our mission statement, at First Unitarian Society, we question boldly, listen humbly, grow spiritually, act courageously, and love unapologetically. The values that drive mission and vision undergird these statements. Here's what Prairie uh, 
values, and it drives our mission. It tries to capture our congregation's core purpose. We want to be known with these key values. When you are at Prairie, we are practicing values that encourages us to grow as human beings and to become part of something greater, richer, and more inclusive than our individual single selves. We value welcoming. We want to be identified, uh, to use that expression in that old TV uh, show, cheers, <laughs> remember? We want to say and be a congregation where everybody knows your name and we're always glad you came. <laughs> we want to be known as exemplifying the value of caring relying on caring ethics. The value of caring means that we are attentive to the needs and concerns we wish to share with one another. Each person on our caring committee has a list of members that are personally, that they are personally attentive to and have identified those individual members who have a special need or concern and then plan some way of connecting to that. And caring implies that we listen to one another in a mutually respectful way. Mm -hmm. Our goal to practice lifelong learning is a value that encompasses our religious exploration program from preschool age children all the way to our adult religious education offerings. One major way that we implement this value is our annual congregational retreat. Since 1970, Prairie has been going off campus. This fall, we will be retreating at Bethel Horizons Retreat Center near Dodgeville, Wisconsin. This three-day event is where we eat, sleep, meet, sing, meditate, explore, and dwell with nature, play and learn together, all valued as community building and personal enriching experiences. Can I say something about the values that uh, undergird our, this is what we aspire to uh, in our vision statement. Our social action committee leads our exploration and decision-making around ways to lead our congregation to address racism and other injustices within our congregation and the wider community. We do this through our relationship with Allied Partners and Allied Food Bank, our neighborhood food pantry, uh, facilitating Perry, uh, Prairie's part in Madison's Interfaith Hospitality Network. We are an active member of MOSES, Madison Organizing in Strength, Equity, and Solidarity. MOSES is a grassroots interfaith Nonpartisan, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working for transformative justice in Dane County in Wisconsin, aiming to reduce incarceration. And to address our need to break down racial boundaries in our South Madison community, we have recently engaged with our neighboring uh, religious congregation, Second Baptist Church. Uh, that's an Amer African American congregation. I and their minister, Anthony Wade, have exchanged pulpits. We are also uh, we also had a recent joint service in their congregation, and that was to celebrate Memorial Day. The first Memorial Day was held in Charleston, South Carolina, by African Americans right after the Civil War. And yesterday, our congregation was invited by their congregation to picnic together on their lawn outside their church. So we believe these kinds of activities will better allow us to serve as catalysts for positive change, inspiring empathy and curiosity, and to champion a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. Karen? Thank you, Ralph. So at Reeb, when we created this new mission statement a few years back, we realized that our original statement is actually a beautiful expression of our values. And so we 
that original statement on our website under the right under the mission statement under the heading our values so that made my job here really easy hey. that statement says we embody a broad spectrum of cultures lifestyles and creeds we honor the earth and the seasons of nature we value truth and reason over doctrine and dogma we encourage social action in the name of liberty and justice we celebrate our community and the journey of life, and we unite in our quest for personal and spiritual growth. Beyond the values that those very prescient founders lifted up, beyond those values that I see expressed here, the values of diversity and earth care and sustainability, reason, justice, interdependence, our humanity, transformation. I see all of those in that statement. And beyond that, I say we put a lot of value, <laughs> put a lot of value on relationship, right? This is who we are at Reeb. We put a lot of value on radical welcome. We put a lot of value on peace. We put a lot of value on care for each other. Our systems and our structures, our ministry teams, are all focused very beautifully on those values. Um, I'm not gonna say a lot about those. If you're curious, we have people here from most of those ministry teams um, and they're more than happy to share, I think, as we eat. Um, but yeah, relationship, mm -hmm. radical welcome, peace and care. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, me? <laughs> We got to get back into the groove of whose turn is it? It used to be natural, and then one of us left. So we'll say who? <laughs> um, so as Kelly mentioned, a lot of last year was spent developing these new vision and mission statements. And for those of you involved, you'll, <laughs> for those of you involved, some of you are making faces here today because you remember the endless amounts of, of meetings that we had. But one of the best parts were all of the ways that people engaged in saying what values mattered to them in what they wanted to see in these statements. Um, you might recall all of the multicolored post-it notes all over the commons where people wrote long things that carried on through multiple post-it notes, or they wrote one word on a post-it note and that was it. Um, so as I was thinking back about what were those values that mattered to people, what kept coming up, hospitality, radical welcome over and over and over. So in that first sentence, Kelly read, the vision of FUS is to be a spiritual community of belonging. I think the most, maybe the loudest voice that came out of those conversations was that we are about a place where everyone belongs. Everyone is welcome at the table and we're always willing to pull up another chair so belonging um, is the one that stands out for me. There was also, I think, if you see inherent in both of them, there is this recognition of our interdependence, mm -hmm. right? In a very individualized culture that we live in, um, we heard again and again and again, what is it that you love about this place? This is the place where I get to hold on to the fact of how much we need each other and how truly independent we are. Um, so hospitality, welcome, belonging, our interdependence, and at the core of all of that is love. And so that mission statement ends with love unapologetically. Um, and that's, I feel like that is who we are. Kelly, I completely agree. And thank you for saying it better than I could. It occurred to me uh, that part of my job is to make the implicit explicit. Mm -hmm. And when I explain First Unitarian Society to other people, whether it be people in our community uh, here in Madison or to other Unitarian Universalist ministers that I'm often called into dialogue with for one reason or another, I always try to remember to emphasize our root value of beauty. 
Not because that's unique to us. I think that any Unitarian Universalist congregation values beauty at some level, but it is a particularly strongly held value that I believe we hold as a congregation. And at our best, I think that it reinforces all of those other values you just enumerated, that the appreciation of beautiful things, beautiful music, beautiful space, beautiful architecture, beautiful artwork, beautiful words, the beauty of being together moves us towards those deeply held values of justice, of peacemaking, of love. I am persuaded by uh, a quote from one of my favorite singer-songwriters, Phil Oakes, who said at the heart, at the height of uh, resistance to the Vietnam War and its expanding in the 1960s, resistance uh, to the violent and anti-democratic backlash against the civil rights movement and its just demands, in such an ugly time, the truest form of protest is beauty. Oh, and now it's my turn. <laughs> so third question, has the collective trauma that we have experienced because of COVID changed your congregation's values? If so, how? And have those values changes driven any practical changes, changes in the way that you operate, the way that you are together? Okay, you going first? I'm going first? I'm going first. All right. So I love this question because it caused me to think back on those early months of COVID. And do you remember those days when you'd be sitting at home in front of your computer and then a face that you know would pop on the screen like magic? You know, there wasn't a warning. Dorit coming in the meeting. No, it was just, there they are. Do you remember how that felt? Do you remember that joy? That like, I know you. It's my people on a screen in my room. Do you remember? So I don't know if the pandemic experience changed the values or if it heightened them. I think what it did was that and I remember people saying how much we needed community during those days and how different it was and needing to remember to unmute and how do I turn my video on and a breakout room? What in the world is a breakout room and how would I get there? But among all of that was this sense of how much we need each other. And we were reminded of that primal joy of connection, right? When you see it, it was this felt and lived sense of, yes, I'm in a virtual room with these people, but these, these are my people. I am not going through these days alone. So I think when we look at these statements, question boldly, listen humbly, I think that these came out of a time when we needed to develop curiosity and compassion in very new ways because we were learning new ways of being together that called on us to be curious and to be compassionate. I think we are still learning. We're still leaning into these statements. We're still figuring out what they mean for us and how we bring them to life. And I don't know about all of you, but listening to all of these election ads that we can't seem to avoid at this moment, and there's this question going around of what is the world that you want to see? Vote for the worlds that you want to see. And I really love that our vision statement ends with we envision a world fueled by love and justice. That is the world that we want to see. So at Reeb, I don't think I'm seeing a change in values, right? We are who we are and we value what we value. But I am seeing shifts, I think, in how those values are lived out and maybe how they're prioritized. 
I see more emphasis, more energy around the areas of ministry that rise out of the value of relationship and care for one another, like pastoral care and presence, like relationship building, like being welcoming. We do some things the way we used to, perhaps with a little more intention and maybe sometimes not. We have this beautiful suite of greeters who take turns on Sunday mornings. There's always three or four people who are bustling about making sure that everybody who wants to be spoken with is spoken with and making sure that people get name tags and are greeted and made to feel comfortable. Um, and it is a thing we've always done and I think it feels just a little more important these days. And we think a little more about some other things like consent. COVID reminded us that not everybody wants to be touched, right? And so we developed this sticker system, right? So that we can see by looking at each other's name tags, oh, look, you might welcome a hug. You've got a green sticker. We think more about accessibility. We do things like offer masks at the door. And we stream, you know, for FUS folks, this probably isn't a big deal. We've started streaming our worship services. We never did that before COVID. Um, but Tom over here has become a seasoned hand at running worship tech. Yay! And a couple of other um, really valued volunteers who, who do that for us every Sunday morning. I also see less energy for some things. Not less passion, right? We still are who we are. But less time and energy by a lot of us, including me, right? And a lot of you all in the congregation who are Reber's to share in the pursuit of those values and those passions. It doesn't feel like a change in values, but more like a change in how we live them out. And I think we're still looking, we're still working on what our new normal completely looks like in this post-lockdown phase of the pandemic. I see less engagement than pre-COVID times in serving on ministry teams and committees in general, right? Our time has become more precious to us. It feels like a lesson we've learned from COVID is that care for ourselves and those in our close circles is really important and it's worthy of the time and energy that it takes and that we haven't quite yet figured out how to also make our passion for things outside of those circles the values like peace and justice and sustainability more tangible. We're still figuring that out, I think, as humans, and it shows up, I think, in my congregation. It's not just COVID, of course. It feels like this intersecting trauma response to both that and these rising levels of anxiety in these times, right? The global and political stuff that is both just in the air and directly impacts so many of us in our lives and those we love. So one of the ways it impacts us is the shift in how we live at our values as a congregation. Thank you. How about you, Ralph? Okay. <laughs> I'll just share a few things about how Prairie has tried to overcome the pains of isolation during that COVID time. It meant that we weren't having in-person meetings and it moved us to reform or re-emphasize things that we were doing before the COVID, but also some new in-person, small group interest ministries. We have Women of Wonder, also known as w Prairie Women's Group. They meet once a month. We have Circle Dinners. Circle Dinners are a group of six to eight people who meet approximately once a month for dinner and conversation at the home of one of the Circle members. Or they may meet at Prairie's Meeting House. We have a re-emphasis of the Humanist Union. Humanist Union of Madison is affiliated nationally with the American Humanist Association and locally with Prairie. This group meets occasionally after a Sunday service 
service with a potluck lunch and a discussion. Then there's Interweave. Interweave is a group for Perry members and friends who are LGBTQ plus or allies. They meet once a month and with the goal of supporting one another as well as helping to make Prairie a more inclusive community. Then we have covenant groups. Covenant groups consist of six to 10 people who meet regularly to discuss significant life topics. In each section, uh, all participants have the opportunity to share their perspectives, tell their stories, and listen deeply. Then there's the guys group. Prairie Guys Group is an informal men's group that meets on the third Thursday of the month here at, or there at the meeting house. Now, a big effort at overcoming the trauma of isolation caused during the pandemic has been holding a once a month potluck meal right after the Sunday morning service in the meeting room. Since we are still a small number, we can accommodate everyone to sit down break bread together, and enjoy one another. All these activities since the pandemic began in March of 2020 have been helping us to nourish and strengthen our Unitarian Universalist mission and vision to grow more deeply into becoming a more beloved community. So there's a note on our script that says, if time, any more thoughts? Are there any like final wrap up things that come up for any of you before we say, may it be so, <laughs> and may we be so? Thank you. So it is traditional for each of our, thank you, Kelly. I'll just grab hold them for a minute. Um, it's traditional for each of our congregations to take an offering, and I understand that all of us also split the money received between our own operating costs and a local organization whose work aligns with our missions. This morning, instead of trying to figure out how much of your gifts should go to each congregation, we are simply going to give everything we collect to Wilma's Fund, a program of Madison's Outreach LGBTQ Plus Community Center that provides relief for LGBTQ plus homelessness or support to prevent homelessness. Wilma's Fund was started by Donald Haar, an openly gay man who began the fund with proceeds from drag shows that featured his drag character, Wilma Flynn Stone. We will pass offering baskets here in the park. If you are watching the service from afar or later, or even if you're in the park, there are, you can give, you can also give through your congregation's donations pages. There are links for the folks here on uh, the back of your order of service for the donations pages and actually a QR code for the James Reeb congregation in case that would be helpful to you. Thank you for your generosity. My name is Ron Fry. I'm from Prairie. I'm doing the offertory music and my pronouns, given my Oklahoma upbringing, are he, him, and y'all. <laughs> There's a river flowing in my soul. There's a river Flowing in my soul And it's telling me That I'm somebody There's a river Flowing in my soul There's a river Flowing in my heart You might know this and you can join me there's a river flowing in my heart. And it's still and I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my heart. There's a river, this one's mine. Oh, 
rolling in my mind. There's a river flowing in my mind, and it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my mind. There's a river flowing. There's a river flowing. Friends, thank you for your gifts. I want to invite you now to move with me into an attitude of meditation and of prayer. Community, the bonds of care and common good which transform an I and an I and an I into a we can magnify joy. Happiness shared can buoy the hearts of those around us who feel connected enough to celebrate along with us. And sorrow shared may not be lessened, but it is made more bearable. Grief witnessed and accomplished, accompanied by others, can become less overwhelming. A simple part of life rather than a force which consumes it entire. Each of our respective communities has rituals and practices which honor the power of deep feeling shared in community. Today, for this one hour, our three communities form a single body, a community of communities, in some ways familiar and in some ways brand new. If you look to your left and to your right, behind you and before you, you may see people whom you know and people whom you do not know. None of us here knows all of us here, but we are all of us here together. The gladness bursting, the loss lingering, all the stories within us yet to be shared, even in silence we carry them with us, and it is good to be together with them and with each other. Let us give thanks for the earth upon which all of us live, let us give thanks for the sky beneath which all of us dwell. Let us give thanks for the present moment within which all of us abide. Upon, beneath, and within, there is so much to wonder at. The revolution of the seasons comes from one year to the next. The flowing of water is down to meet the sea and up to join the clouds. The ways in which wisdom passes from person to person, duty from generation to generation, dreams from age to age. Upon, beneath, and within, there is so much to lament. The mighty and the terrible capacity of our species to make war upon itself. The frightful force of our planet's ecology disrupted and distorted by hubris and greed. The hunger of the hungry, the loneliness of the lonely, the exploitation of the exploited the hopelessness of those without hope. Upon, beneath, and within, there is so much reason to hope. The compassion of the caregivers, the understanding of the peacemakers, the hunger of those who hunger for justice, the courage of the people who forgive, the humility of the people who need and seek forgiveness, the vision of those who restore, who create, who persevere. In thanks, in wonder, in lament, and in hope, we pray. Amen. This is a response we sing in FUS. Sing with us if you know it. There is a
I invite you to rise in body and or in spirit to sing our closing hymn. Some of you may know this one. Blue Boat Home. Let us now extinguish our chalice. Let us go in peace and joy one another and share in the pop life that we're going to now enter into. So this is just closing this part of our gathering. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you.